Well, I'd take your Bible, if you would, and turn over to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 11. Did you find your place in Luke chapter 11? We had some challenges this morning in a Sunday school as far as it was our move up Sunday, and I think everybody found their class okay, but uh, it shifted us around a little bit at the last minute, had to make some, uh, some changes and tightened up a couple of our classes, and uh, you know, you can't throw people out of their normal habitat. But uh, was, especially Mr. Brewer's class got a little tight there in the kitchen, and we didn't even have any extra food for them being in the kitchen, so we at least could have done that. Uh, but we'll hopefully solve some of these issues, We're certainly on working on, on uh, doing that and shifting things around a little bit and solving. You may have been over to the old fellowship hall and seen that we've already begun the walls over there and should have that done fairly quickly. We'll add three more classrooms, and then we're going to move uh, the teenagers over to half of that fellowship hall instead of the modular because they've outgrown that. And so just a number of different things we're trying to do to accommodate, but we're thankful for the problem. Uh, it's, it's really not a problem, it's just an adjustment, just something we've got to work with. So uh, just bear with us. As you find your place in Luke chapter 11, we read the first part of this chapter last week, which of course uh, the theme along with the book of Luke is he came to seek and to save that which was lost. And the emphasis there was prayer and for us to be able to uh, get from God what we're to set before the lost. The subject changes here in the second half of the chapter, but let's have a word of prayer and then we'll begin. Lord, I pray that you'd help us tonight as we open up the Word of God to, in a very practical way, challenge our hearts to cause us to ourselves be good stewards of the truth that you've entrusted us with. Certainly those that Jesus was exposed to while he was on this earth, a good number of them did not take advantage of the truth. And rejected him, and yet there were those that were deeply affected by meeting the Lord Jesus Christ. May we tonight be great stewards of your word, and may you challenge hearts. We thank you for what you'll do in Jesus' name. Amen. Often when Jesus was on the earth, and as he was preaching, and as he was performing miracles, there were those that, of course, were enamored by his miracles, that were maybe watching from afar. There were those who obviously received that he was the Son of God. And then, of course, his greatest enemy when he was preaching, were the Pharisees and the Sadducees, as they were constantly trying to stop and hinder and catch him in his words, which, of course, they were never able to do. When the second half of this chapter, we see that Jesus is dialoguing, to some extent, with the Pharisees. And if you'll notice by way of a text, look down to the end of this chapter. And in verse 53 of the end of chapter 11, it says, As he said these things unto them, the scribes and the Pharisees began to urge him vehemently and to provoke him to speak of many things, laying wait for him and seeking to catch something out of his mouth that they might accuse him. That is, their approach to the words of Jesus is we want him to say more because if he says enough, he may contradict himself and we may be able to catch something that he said. If he says enough, we may be able to look for a crack or a crevice or some type of a problem with it and you know that's how some people approach the Word of God. If you simply come to God's Word looking for a problem, looking for a crevice, looking for something you might criticize it by, first of all, you'll not legitimately find one. But even if you were to uh, come to the conclusion that you can't find one, God's still not going to show you anything because you've not been a steward of the Word of God. Now, it's okay to come with an open mind. It's good to remove preconceived ideas, but to open this book and say, this is God's word, I want him to speak to me, that's who God wants to speak to. He says, you shall seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Now, Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. As I've said before, that does not mean that he wasn't interested uh, in certain groups of people that perhaps were not lost. All of us are lost. But when it emphasizes that he came to seek the lost, that is, a person who does not recognize their lost condition is not going to benefit from what Jesus did. Now, the Pharisees fell into that category. It's not that they didn't need Christ, but they never recognized their need. So I notice in this chapter, as he dialogues with the Pharisees, he reminds them of their great responsibility because of the light that they've been given. The only conclusion they draw is that, well, if he talks more, maybe something he says we can catch him, they totally miss the confrontation that Jesus brought on them. Now, it starts off in this uh, second part of this chapter here in verse 14, and you'll notice here now, 
that it begins with a rationalization. In verse 14, as he was casting out a devil, and it was dumb. That is, the person who was demon-possessed had been so possessed by this devil that he was not able to speak. And it came to pass when the devil was gone out that the dumb spake, and the people wondered. No doubt this was a remarkable miracle. The fact that here was a person who had no ability to speak, and a demon had overtaken him. Jesus, of course, by his authority, as he had done numerous times, cast out the demon, and immediately the man is able to speak. Now, Jesus had claimed to be the Son of God. He had demonstrated by many miracles. We've seen others in, earlier in this book, and of course many are not even recorded. It was evident that by his power, by his ability, he could at will overcome the devil's crowd. He could cast out a demon. He could heal a person with a physical infirmity. He never did it just as a simple sensational show, but he did it to meet a need and to demonstrate who he was. Now, here they see one of these miracles take place, but notice how they rationalize. In verse 15, some of them said, He cast out devils through Beelzebub, the chief of the devils. Others, tempting him, sought of him a sign from heaven. But he, knowing their thoughts, said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and a house divided against a house falleth. If Satan also be divided against himself, how shall his kingdom stand? Because you say that I cast out devils through Beelzebub. Now, Luke didn't emphasize it here, but we know over in the other gospel, especially in Matthew, when they accuse him of casting out devils through the power of the devil, he reminds them that what they have done is they've blasphemed the Holy Ghost. He said every sin that a person commits could be forgiven, but the blasphemy of the, against the Holy Ghost would never be forgiven. Now, people have argued about what that might be. It seems quite evident. It's to attribute to the devil the works of the Holy Spirit. Some would say, well, only it could be done while Jesus was here on the earth. Uh, others would uh, try to say, well, it's, it, comes, it's, it's, uh, it can take place at any time if a person claimed that the devil had done what the Holy Spirit did. Uh, one thing is clear with all of the different approaches is the people who commit this sin are rejectors of the truth. See, it begins with rejecting the truth. When they looked at what Jesus did, what should they have done? That's a remarkable miracle. This man has fulfilled Isaiah 61 to the letter. He has claimed to be the Son of God. He's demonstrated it by his works and by his power. At his baptism, a voice came from heaven, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. He's born where the Bible said he would be born. He traveled to the place the Bible said he would travel. The star showed up. All of these things had gathered around Jesus. They should have simply said, He must be the Messiah. He must be the one we're looking for. But rather than doing that, they came to the conclusion, I'm not willing to accept that truth. The one thing that I will not take is that the person who rebukes us, the person who has told us that we're hypocrites, the person who doesn't hold us up on high, which the Pharisees enjoyed being the religious leaders of the day, if he doesn't agree with us, then we're not going to accept who he is. So they rationalized. They said, we can't admit that he's got power. We can't deny that he's uh, done a miracle. So you know what? I believe he cast out devils by the power of the devil. Now think about the rationalization. Obviously what the devil was doing is he was using demon possession to disrupt the culture. By the way, he still uses demon possession to disrupt the culture. You know, demon possession in the days of Jesus uh, was a little bit more evident and obvious because they didn't have some of the things to mask it in the day in which he lived, but the demons aren't gone. There's still plenty of demons around. Now no doubt in my mind, in my thinking, their power was diminished post-resurrection because of what Jesus accomplished when the gospel came to the earth and the Holy Spirit of God moved into the heart of believers. It diminished some of the realm of the demon possession, but still in the devil's crowd, there's plenty of folks who are influenced by demons and some well-possessed. It doesn't shock me at all that, uh, to think, and certainly don't think I'm being sensational, when a guy can stick a gun out of a window at a, a big old concert and begin to mow down hundreds of people at a concert, he's demon-possessed. When somebody can indiscriminately walk into a store, pull out a gun, and just shoot every human being they see, uh, the devil was a murderer from the beginning. You say, well, he's mentally ill. Not all mental illness necessarily implies demon possession, but all demon-possessed people demonstrate mental illness. Now, 
There's no question there's demon possession, and the devil loves to disrupt cultures by demon possession. So here Jesus cast out one of the devils. In fact, he's cast out many devils. He's disrupting what the devil is trying to do, and they rationalize and say, well, he's doing it by the power of the devil. Now, Jesus says this, which is quite obvious. If Satan be divided against himself, how can his kingdom stand? What, pro- what productivity would there be in the devil saying, well, I'm going to um, energize Jesus to go cast out more devils? It wouldn't make any sense at all. There would be no profit in it. In fact, it would be very much uh, anti-productive for the devil to do that, and they well knew it was. But, you know, when you're trying to rationalize away the truth, you'll come up with some pretty dumb conclusions. You know, some of the stuff people come up with today because they don't believe this book. I mean, this Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now, that's pretty easy to believe, isn't it? I mean, if God, and it didn't say in the beginning, uh, the gods created the earth, because you'd say, well, man, if there was a bunch of them, you'd think they'd compete with one another. Matter of fact, if there was a bunch of them, who really would God be? Because there'd be no one powerful person. It wouldn't make any sense. But when the Bible comes against all known revelation apart from this book and says, God created the heavens and the earth, That's a pretty logical approach, makes complete sense. Somebody bigger than me, more powerful than I, who's been around for eternity, created me. That explains a lot. But man hears that truth and he says, if God created me and I accept that, then I'm responsible to him. And I don't want to be responsible to God, so you know what? I'm going to rationalize. I believe we probably got here randomly. I believe probably some inanimate, unintelligent, who knows where it came from, doesn't have any ability to get up out of bed on his own, dot, blew up, and ultimately, here I am. You can add all the billions you want to to an inanimate piece of dirt that blew up, and you still got a lot of questions. Add it, make it 10 billion, 14 billion. Where'd the dirt come from? Where'd the energy come from to blow it up? Uh, The law of thermodynamics says matter is not created nor destroyed, so you're telling me every bit of matter in this entire universe was all in one ball and it was only that big, And then it blew up and it got bigger. Okay, none of that makes any sense. But it doesn't matter if it makes sense. The world is rationalizing because they don't want to believe what this book says. Now, man's heart and man's nature is to turn from the truth. And Jesus said, if Satan be divided against himself, how can that kingdom stand? And then he, of course, mentions, not in Luke, but in the same context, all manner of sin can be forgiven men, but you'd better be careful when you reject the truth because that's what they did. So first of all, there's a rationalization. Now he goes on to talk about uh, the fact that he's defeated the devil, and he makes that clear, and he uh, points out, he says in verse 22, when a, or verse 21, when a strong man armed keepeth his palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him, he taketh from him all his armor, wherein he trusted, and divideth his spoils. He that is not with me is against me, and he that gather, gathereth not with me scattereth. You know, there is no parallel spiritual direction that a person can go in with God that doesn't include the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no side-by-side comparison with any other uh, truth that man might teach of how to know God except with Jesus. If you don't gather with him, you scatter. Now, here the men were confronted with truth. They rationalize it away. Then he also deals, he's in this subject of of demonism, but notice this explanation he gives here about reformation in verse 24. He says, when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, now he had just cast out a demon, of course, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and findeth none. He saith, I will return unto my house whence I came out, and when he cometh, he findeth swept and garnished. Then goeth he, and taketh him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Now, the dialogue that Jesus is giving now to the Pharisees as he's speaking to them and responding to their question is probably a parable. In other words, he didn't say here a certain man was was in, in... Uh, dwelt by a demon, and it was cast out, and seven other demons came. He's speaking here in sort of a parable, but the truth is still there. Now, we learn a couple of things from this. First of all, it does make this point. When a person is possessed by a demon, the demon takes up residence in, for lack of better 
uh, a better place to just say his spirit. The devil takes up inside of him, the demon, and it overcomes him and it makes him do things he would not normally do. Wherever that place is, the house, the inside of a person, um, I don't, it's a spiritual aspect. It's not explained, but Jesus says when he goes into a man, it's not necessarily a physical place, but a spiritual realm. That's where the devil operates. Now, when the demon leaves that spiritual realm, he's cast out by whatever outside force, there is something empty there. It's an empty house. Now, by default, if I'm not possessed by a demon, by default, it's an empty house. Well, now, what that house needs is it needs the Holy Spirit. When a person is born again, the Holy Spirit takes up residence in that heart. You know, somebody says, well, can a Christian be possessed by a devil? Well, that's impossible because the Holy Spirit lives inside the Christian. But a, a, a Christian can be influenced. Certainly, the devil tries to influence believers. But the point is, when a person simply says, and Jesus isn't here really just teaching all about demonism. He's got a point here. The point he's saying is, here's a person confronted with the truth. Now, when the first group was confronted with the truth, they rationalized. The second group reforms. You know, a reformation is insufficient to change a person. A reformation is temporary. When a person is confronted with the truth, that is, they've heard the truth of the gospel, they uh, recognize their sinful condition, and I've, I've seen people like this, and you have as well, they know their life is going the wrong way. They know their activities, whether it be the use of drugs, whether it be an immoral lifestyle, whether it be just trying to climb the corporate ladder and, and it's to the, uh, the, the, the disruption of their family. Whatever direction they're taking, they don't like, and they get confronted with the fact that that is negative. Sometimes a person will say, well, I need to change. Well, a change needs to take place, but get the I out of it. God needs to change you. You see, when a person says, I'm going to change, I'm going to turn over a new leaf. You know, these drugs are destroying my life, I'm going to stop. Well, you know, a person uh, might go to a rehab, get the thing out of their system and get some discipline in their life and get focused on something else, and they might even turn over. Often they don't without some outside power, but maybe they did, and they, and they reformed their life. But Jesus is saying, if you don't put something back inside the Holy Ghost, if you're not genuinely converted, if you're not born again, you're going to go back just like you were before, but it's not going to stop there. Seven more demons, more wicked than him, are going to come back. The Bible talks about the dog returning to its vomit. It uses that as an analogy to say, here's a person who simply tries to clean up himself without the power of God, and he'll end up worse than he was to start with. So what he's done is he has reformed, but he's not been redeemed. So when I respond to truth, maybe I rationalize. Maybe I simply reform, that is, do it on my own. But then notice he makes a statement here in verse 29, still speaking to the same crowd about a rising up that will take place. Look in verse 29, when the people were gathered thick together, he began to say, this is an evil generation. They seek a sign. Now, where'd that come from? Because they said back in verse 16, tempting him, they sought of him a sign from heaven. You know, who, is, who are these people to say they want a sign from heaven? Think about that. Jesus, now, we're well into his ministry. Healed the sick, cleansed the leper, cleansed the uh, open blinded eyes. Uh, man born blind from his birth, he's got him uh, healed. Here's a man sitting uh, by the pool of Bethesda. His legs have been strengthened. I mean, just, just go over the miracles. And they come to Jesus and say, we want a sign from heaven. Well, I think they've had plenty of signs. What, you know what they wanted? They wanted their sign. Here's what I think you ought to do, God. Here's the way you do it. You know, sometimes somebody will try to make a deal with God. Well, God, I don't know if you're real, but if you are, you do this particular thing. Show up in a vision, put a million dollars in my checking account, I mean, whatever it might be, then I'll believe in you. I doubt if you would. You'd rationalize it away and say, oh, it was just a coincidence. That wasn't nothing to that. If you don't believe the words of Jesus... You're not going to believe it, though one rose from the dead. Now, in this particular passage, he speaks of this evil generation that wanted a sign. He said, there shall no sign be given it but the sign of Jonas the prophet. For as Jonas was a sign unto the Ninevites, so shall also the Son of Man be to this generation. 
Do you know probably, and I'm, I'm just saying this not out of authority, but just because I know it's out there and you, it's not difficult to find, there's plenty of liberals that approach the Bible uh, from a standpoint that they don't believe any of the miracles. They think it's good, a good moral book. Uh, it can teach you some principles, and there's less and less of that. A lot of them don't even think that. But people will approach this book and say, well, I don't really believe in the supernatural things that take place in the Bible. They don't believe in the flood. Uh, they don't believe in the creation of man by God's direct act and so forth. But if there is a miracle in the Bible that is attacked, mocked, even people that say, well, I believe some of them, but I don't believe that one, it's Jonah being swallowed by a whale. Why would that be such an attacked miracle? People have gone so far as to say, well, now we have updated science and we know that a whale's throat is only, you know, so big. Uh, he can eat plankton and so forth, but there's no way that he could do that. We know that the stomach of a whale is full of uh, uh, fluids and acid and so forth that a man couldn't possibly live inside of that uh, whale's stomach. Um, all of these different type of uh, biological things to try to say that's an impossibility. Let me let you in on something. God wasn't in the book of Jonah nor in the New Testament indicating by any means that that was a human brought about event. It was a miracle. God did a miracle. He said that the same miracle that he did with Jonah, he said, you're going to get a sign just like the Ninevites got. Now, I don't want to go into great detail. This is actually a sermon in itself. But the Ninevites, what did they see? They're out there working in their port. And, of course, this is a wicked city. And I don't know out in the middle of where all these, uh, the shipping is coming in and people are casting nets and, and it's a fishing type town. And here a big old fish comes up and spits Jonah out with a pile of vomit sitting right there on the top of the shore. And they look, oh man, you see that whale vomit? Something's moving in there. Is that a fish? Man, that's a guy. I mean, Jonah gets, walks out of the vomit and, you know, shakes it off. Oh man, that was quite an experience. And then he says, I want to see the king. He begins to walk to the streets of Nineveh. Forty days and Nineveh will be destroyed. Well, now you could have listened to him if you wanted to. A guy just got spit out of a well and got up and started walking through the street. It didn't take long for people to say, that's the guy. That's him. You know what they did? They listened to him. Now, that's remarkable that a man was spit out of a well, got up and walked through the street, and they repented. Man, if he said that, boy, I, I'm going to listen to that guy. And they said 40 days and we're going to be destroyed. They repented. Well, let me tell you, the Son of God was put in a grave and walked out of the grave alive and demonstrated that he is the Son of God and these people wouldn't listen to him. You know what he said they were going to do? The men of Nineveh will rise up in judgment against this generation. He says it about the queen of Sheba as well in verse 31. He said, the queen of the south shall rise up in judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the uttermost part of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, a greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh shall rise up in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonas, and behold, a greater than Jonas is here. Here the queen of Sheba and the Ninevites were heathen. The Jews had the word of God. Now these heathens had very little testimony. Here's the queen of Sheba, off in a distant land, had heard of Solomon and heard that he was a man that knew God and that his wisdom demonstrated that he had communicated directly with the creator. She said, come what may, if I never live to get back, I'm going to travel and I'm going to talk to Solomon. I believe he can tell me what I'm looking for. Well, she had heard great things. And it was clear when you read that passage, and of course it's implied by Jesus as well, she went to find out about God. She heard of the Lord and how the Lord had blessed him. Who is this Jehovah God that would give a man this kind of wisdom? I want to find out who he is. Here is a heathen who had just a little bit of light, but she said, I want more light. And she went and found it. And you know what's going to happen when you one day... Uh, enter into the place called heaven and you've gotten over the sparkle and talked to Jesus and met some of the people, if you wanted to, you can meet the queen of Sheba because she's going to be there. She met Solomon that day and found out who God was and she said, the half hadn't even been told. I didn't even know what I was going to find when I got here. Same thing true with the Ninevites. Do you realize that old wicked city, vile, filthy so much, God said he had to wipe it off the map. They repented at the preaching of Jonas much to the dismay of Jonah. 
So they repented. They're going to be in heaven. Those Ninevites turned. God didn't have to judge them. Now, I recognize that was an earthly judgment, but they responded to the light that God gave them. So how do you, you know how I know they're going to be in heaven? Because he says at the judgment, they're going to rise up against the people who reject the gospel. They're going to stand up against these Pharisees. Now, here's a Pharisee who has memorized a good portion of the first five books of the Bible. I mean, some of those places are difficult to read, aren't they? You take this offering and pour on some oil on top of it and take a parchment of flour and put in here and the law of the And they memorized it. I mean, they knew it. They were Pharisees. They had this thing down, and they had that much of the Word of God. Here's an old heathen Ninevite that God says when the judgment takes place, they are going to rise up in judgment. That means God's going to say, Pharisee, here's the opportunity you had and what you did with it. Let me show you exactly what you should have done, and he's going to take the queen of Sheba, he's going to take the men of Nineveh, and he's going to say, now they're going to be in heaven for all eternity. Had they rejected the truth, they would have been separated from God, but they wouldn't have been nearly as bad off as they're going to be separated from God. You see, there are degrees of punishment in hell. I can't explain, because I don't believe God reveals it, what it'll be like to go to hell and have a lesser degree of punishment than somebody else who goes. I don't know. All I know is there will be. I don't know what a heathen will be like who's over in some dark jungle who's never even seen a Bible, who died without Christ. I know we need to reach them. I know God doesn't just let them into heaven and let them go. We've got to go and reach them with the gospel. But there is a far greater responsibility on you if you've heard what Jesus did on the cross. He said it's going to be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah than it will be for the people of Capernaum. That's what he's saying in this passage. He is telling uh, the people, the Pharisees that he's dialoguing with, you want a sign. Well, you're going to get a sign. What are you going to do with that sign when it comes? He said, I'm going to come out of the grave on my own. You're going to see me put to death, and there's going to be no question that I'm dead. A man will stick his spear in me, and blood and water will gush out, and the soldiers whose life depended on it will say, there ain't no need to break his legs. He's dead. And he said, they'll put me in there for three days with a big old stone, and the stone's going to be rolled away. I'm going to walk out. What are you going to do with that truth? Jesus knew what they were going to do. They were going to reject it. Now, I see the, the men uh, rationalizing the truth away. Some reform for the truth. Uh, those that uh, hear the truth rise up in judgment. And then notice, if you would, he deals with uh, perhaps those who know the truth and re receive it, but what are they going to do with it? He talks about reflection. Look at verse 33. He said, No man, when he hath lighted a candle, putteth it into a secret place, neither under a bushel, but on a candlestick, that they may come in and see the light. The light of the body is the eye, and therefore when thine eye is single, thy whole body is also full of light. But when thine eye is evil, thy whole body is full of darkness. Take heed, therefore, that the light which is in thee be not darkness. If thy whole body therefore be full of light, having no part dark, the whole shall be full of light, as when the bright shining of a candle doth give thee light. Now I notice two things here, and Jesus seems to be now directing his comments, and he had mentioned this on the Sermon on the Mount, He's directing his comments here to those who perhaps have received the light. There were some that day that saw his miracles, knew what he was, were going to follow him, but he sort of guards against two things. Now, most of us tonight claim to know the Lord Jesus Christ. We've received the light of God. We didn't rationalize it away. We didn't reject it. But now we have become not only recipients of the light, but stewards. We have the truth. He says, first of all, don't hide it. No man takes a candle and says, okay, let me light this candle so I can light up my house. Now I've got it lit. I don't want the wind to blow it out, so I'll put something on top of it so the wind won't blow it out. Well, you could do that if you had a piece of glass, but the idea of a bushel putting it under something like a, a basket that would hide the light, what, did, what good would that light do burning under the underside of that basket? It didn't going to do anything but maybe burn the basket. He said, no, hide the light. You've got it. People need to know it. I mean, I'm supposed to be a steward of God's light, so yes, I've received it, but it's not just for me. Jesus, again, came to seek and to save that which was lost, and he's entrusted us with the light. But then I also think about, it says, as far as the receiving of the light, when I want more light, that light can be hindered. You know how it gets hindered? 
He says uh, in verse 34, the light of the body is the eye. Therefore, when thine eye is single, thy whole body is full of light. Of course, when there's an issue in, the, in your eye, then the whole body is hindered by that. You know, I look at that from a standpoint of a believer, and I think about as I want to know more about God. I read his word, listen to preaching. You know, it's, it's real easy to get distracted by neutral things, not necessarily sinful things. You know, the, the culture dominates us, and, and I like to be informed. I like to know what's going on. I think sometimes it's, uh, it's helpful when I preach God's word to know how that applies to present-day things that we're facing all the time. But I'll tell you a temptation I have. A temptation I have is to be too informed about what the devil's doing. That is, I read too much of the news if I'm not careful. You know, I have... Uh, I try to turn it off, and sometimes it ends up back on. Uh, I got a little app on my phone, a Fox News app. That's not an advertisement, by the way. But I got a, and, and, and inevitably, if I don't set up the setting right, every, all 10 times a day, breaking news. Well, all it is is somebody in the Senate had a bad cold and went to the hospital or whatever. I mean, it's not that breaking, but it, oh, that grabs my attention. What's going on? Oh, somebody else is, uh, you know, trying to pass a law through the legislator. Look, it's good to be informed, but there's a whole lot more to be encouraged about in this book than there is in the pages of a newspaper or a news article. I mean, we can know what's going on and we can be informed, but if you're not careful, your eye can become focused on the events of the day. And if it's not single and you get distracted, before you know it, you're not going to get much light passing through. It's going to get hindered. When your eye is single, that means the distractions are removed. You know what it comes down to? I'm preaching to myself as much as I am to you, is what is most important in your life? I mean, what's, what really is most important, that's where your focus is going to be. So if you're not careful, you can hide the light, you can put it under a bushel, or it can be hindered. So that's our reflection. Now, just for a moment here, I'm not going to read all these verses, but notice now in verse 39, he turns now, he is asked to go eat with a Pharisee. He does this often. Verse 37, as he spake, a certain Pharisee besought him to dine with him. And he went in and sat down to meet. You know, some of the Pharisees did believe in Jesus. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. He came to Jesus by night and he said, Rabbi, we know you're a teacher come from God. Well, he's far more than a teacher come from God. And Jesus told him the, how to be saved, and I believe Nicodemus was saved. He begged the body of Jesus at, at the end of the gospel. Uh, there's uh, Pharisees that would invite him over because they said there's something about him, his teaching. I want to know. There were, there were sincere Pharisees, but as a group, they would be there as well. They were at the dinner. So now he's got all of these Pharisees sitting around. Somebody's asked him to come over, and even the one that invited him could be in the same uh, position. But notice verse 39, the Lord said unto him, now do the Pharisees make clean the outside of the cup and the platter, but the inward part is full of ravening and wickedness. That was the bottom line. They look good on the outside, wicked on the inside. He said in verse 42, Woe unto you Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs. That's great. You go pick some herbs and you give a tenth of them to God. He says you ought to have done that, but what you overlooked was more important. You pass over the judgment and the love of God. These ought you to have done and not to leave the other undone. The, the, yeah, go ahead and tithe your mint and your rue. That's fine. You're trying to do what God said, but don't leave undone the judgment and the love of God. There was the uh, problem with the Pharisees. Well, you know, the lawyers were very similar to Pharisees. The Pharisees was more of the religious organization. The lawyers were the uh, scientific students of the, of the law, and they tried to show people what it was they were supposed to do. Not only keep the law of Moses, but keep all of these little feast days. How far can you walk on the Sabbath day? How many oxen can you actually get out of a ditch and be legitimate? And how much rope knots can you tie? I mean, they had all kinds of stuff they had added to the law. So they said in verse 45, then answered one of the lawyers and said, Master, thus saying, thou reproachest us also. I always get a little chuckle out of this because it's almost like the lawyer says, well, Jesus, that's pretty good you got on those guys, but you may not realize that you, you're kind of stepping on us a little bit too. And so they're expecting Jesus to say, well, look, now, sorry about that, guys. I, I was just getting on to these Pharisees. I didn't want you to be insulted by it. 
He says in verse 46, Woe unto you also, ye lawyers, for you laid men with grievous burdens to be born, and ye yourselves will not touch them. In other words, you're just as bad as those guys. You ought to be insulted because you're doing the same thing they're doing, maybe even worse. You know what they were accused of? He says, you won't go to heaven yourself, and you won't suffer those that are entering to go in. You're going to die and go to hell, and your teachings making other folks go as well, thinking they've got to live up to your standard. He ends it like this. He says in verse 49, he said, Therefore also the wisdom of God, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they shall slay and persecute, that the blood of all the prophets, which was shed from the foundation of the world, may be required of this generation. He says, From the blood of Abel, you know who that is, killed by Cain. He was considered to be the first prophet. That is, he was a testimony for God. From the blood of Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, which is perished between the altar and the temple, which we read about in post-exile, verily I say unto you, it shall be required of this generation. You see, there's a requirement. You know what the requirement is? Is what are you going to do with the light that God has given you? Now, Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. If you want to be a recipient of that, well, you've got to get lost. It's not hard to be lost. All you've got to do is accept what God says about mankind. Being saved is also simple. You just take the truth and receive it, and Jesus does the rest. The world has to respond to the truth of God. They either got to accept it or they got to reject it. But you know, as we tonight as believers, we are the true stewards. That is, God has given us this light to share with others. Now, yes, we've received it. We're not going to rationalize it away. We're not trying to just reform ourselves. But what are we going to do with that light when it comes to a lost world? Because, yes, there's always going to be rejectors. But the fact is there's folks that are searching. There's folks that don't even know they're searching. There's people out there that need this truth, and when they hear it, they'll know they need it. And we're responsible to give it to them. Let's go ahead and have a closing word of prayer tonight.